I know. <laughs> that was me at six this morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> if you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And I want to start by thanking Tony. Tony Johnson gave a great message on obedience and donkeys last week. So that was <laughs> kind of entertaining and cool. Uh, so we're continuing in the rest of our story. This is our series. And so a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the early life of Jesus. And right from Christmas time, from the shepherds, through the magi, through Jesus' parents, Simeon, Anna, there were people searching for Jesus and finding Jesus. So that was kind of the application there. Tony took us to obedience, important glue there between these two messages. Today we're going to talk about the key, or one of the keys here, which is relationship. Now this got me thinking about a story about hot air. A hot air balloon, that is. You'll see where I'm going in a minute. So <laughs> in the mid-1900s, or a little bit later, slightly later, people wanted to make these transatlantic uh, flights with the hot air balloons, see if they could get across. And there were many failed attempts, which isn't really funny. I don't know why I'm smiling. But anyway, they tried to go on these hot air balloons from the United States over to Europe. And finally, in 1978, Double Eagle 2 made it. Double Eagle 1, they landed in Iceland. It was really bad. They got frostbite. So they tried again. Right? So then it became encouraging and kind of a more popular thing to take these transatlantic flights in the hot air balloon. So here's a story <laughs> about one particular group of people. They decide to go for it, right? So what are you going to do? It's about a week it's going to take you. Six days a week, and so you're going to bring all the provisions you need, right, in this basket, but it's like not a rickety basket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you bring? Water, like a lot of canned goods and stuff like that, you know, maybe tuna, sardines, I don't know, anything in a can, not the beans, you already got the hot air. So anyway, <laughs> oh, it's bad, so <laughs> it gets worse. So, they, you know, they pack all the necessary provisions, they have a little extra room, they start thinking about the week. Right? All right, this is going to be a week, so we've got some other things that are important to us as we prepare for this journey. So they came up with a few other things. Chocolate. And all the ladies are like, yep. But guys are like, what? No, so anyway, chocolate was important. So they took some chocolate, a case of chocolate. We're going to put a case of chocolate in there. What other things are we going to need during that week? Cigarettes. So back then, everybody smoked, right? So you see the like World War II movies and stuff, what's in your ration kit? Some of you are going, yep, that was my ration. Lucky strikes, right? So everybody, it's necessary. So you've got to bring cigarettes. They're not too heavy. We'll bring a case of them on. What else is necessary in a week? Wine. Wine is going to be really necessary, right? So they take some wine. So people are like, yeah, okay. So <laughs> they take the wine. Good. What else? Well, see, this is kind of like early 80s, late 70s, we don't have smartphones. So what else? Well, we're going to need some reading material, right? <laughs> so they bring some reading material on board in the form of magazines. But they had a lot of pictures, so you can just use your imagination. They bring that on. So a case, and if you've ever picked up a box of books or something like that, paper, it's heavy. So they bring that on, and they're like, okay, we got it. We're going to make it a week. We can do it. So they go up, and there's a certain point. They're over the Atlantic. And they start sinking rapidly. And these things go really high, like 20,000 feet you can go in these things. So you get down to like 4,000 feet, it's an emergency. It's a bad, bad thing. Unless you're about to land, they're not going to land in the water. So they decide to, we're going to use a big word, I'm going to teach you a big word, jettison a bunch of stuff, right? So just throw out, jettison. So everyone's like, ooh, that's a good word. We're going to jettison some stuff. So they've already jettisoned the ballast. It's another big word, right? But this is for balance in a ship or a hot air balloon and sometimes some weight if you need it. We don't need the weight. So we're trying to get up. They already got rid of everything. And they have not elevated at all. Uh-oh. What are we going to do? we got to get rid of some important things. So... The chocolate. They're guys, right? So that's not important. <laughs> We're to get rid of the chocolate, right? Still, hot air balloon, not going up. Mm, a problem. What are we going to get rid of next? The cigarettes. <laughs> we'll get rid of those, right? No altitude. The wine. That was a good year. So, glug, glug, glug. overboard. Jettison that. Not going up. 
Finally, <laughs> they probably should have tried this first. The magazines, books are heavy. Bye, ladies. So they jettison that. And finally, now they start coming up. And they make it to Europe. Now, it seems like the lesson here would be super obvious. Right? It's pastor, why is he telling the story? Well, there's an obvious lesson here. Right? So what are they doing? They're getting rid of stuff they shouldn't have been doing in the first place. Right? So did they learn their lesson? Did they go back to any of these things? Did they get maybe what God was putting down? No. They landed in Europe. That's where they specialize in all of those things. So no lesson. <laughs> Why do you think they were going there anyway? So now jettison, interesting thing, right? getting rid of things in your life. Now I know this is going to happen. This is going to happen today. And so don't do it. All right, so I'm preventing this because somebody's going to get in a fight. Like two of your kids are going to get a fight in the car, right? And they're going to be bopping each other with a toy. And dad's going to be like, jettison the toy. Be like, pastor said, jettison what's not important to you. It causes you to sin. So don't do that. I've had that done to me as a kid. It's traumatic. So here's, <laughs> here's the lesson. <laughs> here's the lesson. Now, this can be like relationships. In relationships, if we want to go the distance... We sometimes need to abandon some things that might seem important to us. There's your lesson. Serious, right? I like when he ends on a joke. Nope. Anyway, <laughs> so we saw that Jesus spoke to the teachers. This is one of the reasons that his parents had to go looking for him. Now we're going to look at a section where Jesus and his relative John are now grown up. And the background on this year is John, the baptizer or the Baptist, because that's how we call him to these days. But he's got an actually a very large ministry. It's huge. And we know this. Historians talked about it back in the day. It's a very, very large ministry. Whereas Jesus' ministry has not yet initiated yet. The point of John is he's preparing the way for Jesus at this point. So here's what I want to show you. The Bible is not in chronological order. We've discussed this, so I made another chart. And it can get kind of confusing here because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no particular order on the second line there. Uh, they're, they're Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. right? So they're similar. Just think of it like that. They're similar to one another. Matthew's the longest, gives the most details. Mark is the shortest. Luke's in the middle, right? So they're giving you... Different perspectives, not differences. They're not different from one another. John's different. John gives a lot of other uh, accounts and a lot of other things here. So you got to kind of look at them and then kind of paste them back where they belong. They're not chron chronological. So that's what you're seeing here and what we're going to look at today. So John 1, an intro to John. Then you have these three are kind of, you know, I didn't put them in order, but Mark, Matthew, and Luke. They're covering John preparing the way. You can see Mark's like a little shorter. So then Jesus is baptized, Jesus is tempted, and then you have the testimony of John the Baptist. And you'll see it, it should be clear how they happen in that chronological-ish order. It's difficult. So let's jump right in. John 1.6. God sent a man, John the Baptist, literally a man named John, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. The light is Jesus. So we go to Matthew 3.1. In those days, John the Baptist, same guy we were just talking about, came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Clear the path for him. Just noteworthy, that's the Greek version of the Old Testament that's being quoted there. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem and from all over Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees, these are the religious teachers, they're kind of not getting it right, coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, brood of vipers, it literally says. He exclaimed, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing 
For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. I baptize in water those who repent of their sins and turn to God, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and carry or tie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and in fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. So it's kind of like some agrarian illustrations here. So this is how you kind of get like the wheat stalks, the wheat, the separating the grain from the chaff. That's how you get the grain. So he's going to separate out and what's being said here, going back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the good and bad fruit. Okay, that's essentially what's going on here. If you're not producing any, any good fruit, chop down. Throw into the fire. We get what's implied there by fire. That's what he's saying. Then we see if we just keep reading right along, it goes immediately into this. Matthew 3, 13. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done from what we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism... As Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. Noteworthy here. Trinity. You see it right there. It's a complete picture of the Trinity. It happens in this situation. So you have the Son, Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, and you have the Father all in the same picture operating. Then we see Jesus is tempted. So if we just turn the page, it's right there, Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, the tempter. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came to him and said, You are the Son of God. Tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, quoting Deuteronomy. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you're the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, important, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Deuteronomy again, chapter 6. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil went away and angels took care of Jesus. So there's a lot of noteworthy things in here. We're going to jump back to this, but it's noteworthy that Jesus is initiating his ministry by fasting. Very interesting. So this is the way he gets baptized, immediately goes out fasting. The devil's trying to tempt him, right? So he's in a period of weakness here. He's trying to get close here. He's preparing himself for this ministry. The devil comes into the picture. We're going to hop back into that later. I just want to end here with the testimony of John, and then we'll go to the application. John 1.19. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I'm not the Messiah. Well, then who are you? They asked. Are you Elijah? Remember, Elijah was taken up. <clears throat> are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we were expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah again. I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way for the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, if you're the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet or you aren't, <clears throat> what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be a slave and untie the straps of his sandal. This encounter took place in Bethany in an area east of the Jordan River where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. 
I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. So, interesting. He is far greater than me. He existed long before me. Well, John is the slightly older one. So how is that possible? So this is, he's talking about his deity here. So before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says about himself, John 8. So he's also saying something very important here. Look, look at him, not me. Look at him. He's the one who is greater than me. So this is the preparing of the way. He was preparing people's hearts for the Lord. We read read previously, he's preparing the way. As we saw, we also saw this means preparing ourselves. What was said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? Make sure you're right. Prove, prove by the way you live that you're prepared. Otherwise, so it's, it's not good, right? You must produce good fruit. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down, again, thrown into the fire. So this brings me to a couple of weeks ago. If you weren't here, you can go back and watch that message, uh, that self-examination quiz that I had everybody take. And so what I did is I took the basically the fruit of the flesh, right? So the sins of the flesh, sins of the spirit from Galatians. And I said, okay, look at them and then check off, you know, which you're checking off more or less of. And... Uh, I gave you some encouragement, all right? So I said, even if, please hear this, hear this, don't skip over this part. (laughs) Even if you checked off all of the sins of the flesh, and you're like, this is the behavior I'm normally exhibiting, listen, you are welcome here. Did you hear that? So even if there's a dot in the bad column, you are welcome here. And if you checked all that stuff off, just fine. You're, just keep coming. We are here to help. We love you. We're here to help, and we're here to walk, do life with you. Right? So just don't come up to me and say, I want to preach on Sunday, right? So no. <laughs> and not that I'm perfect either. So I got some in there too. We're all kind of working on it. It's okay. So just hear that part. That's important. A lot of people forget that. But a lot of people will kind of freak out. It's like a New Year's resolution, right? They'll say, this is impossible. Like, this cannot be done. Like, <laughs> it cannot. And so what do they do? They just quit. That's what happens. It becomes like a New Year's resolution. You know what? I'll just try to get this Holy Spirit thing next year, you know, or, <laughs> or whenever. Right? So don't one behavior modification at a time. I've been giving everybody that encouragement. One thing at a time. And I'm going to get into some keys because people ask. They're like, well, okay, how? How do we do this? Okay, the first thing we have to get over is we have to know that it's possible. That's the first thing. Because here's another bad Christian mantra, and this is kind of what it leads to. So there is a prosperity gospel out there just kind of like infecting the church, but in many different ways. And one of them is saying to a lot of people who are identifying as Christians that, you know what, sin is just not a big deal. It's out there. It's not a big deal. All right, we're going to do it, so whatever. Some people call it greasy grace, right? So we're going to do it, whatever. We'll get there, right? So again, if you're in the <laughs> fruit of the flesh, it's okay. I'm not trying to beat you up. I just want to show you scriptural truth. If you're new here, yes, it's a lot of scriptures because I like to hear from God a little bit more than opinions, all right? So this is not an opinion. So here's, here's what you're going to get here. Some people will say, nobody can do it. And I've done this, right, on the Instagram and stuff. Maybe there's a reel and it says, like, look, you know, You're called to be holy. You're called saints. That's the Greek word. Same thing, same word in the Greek. Saints, holy. You're called to be kind of the royal priesthood here, guys. You know, we should be kind of not sinning so much. Then inevitably, someone will come along and say, well, you know what? Nobody can do it, and I'm going to show you, and I'm going to show you where they'll do this. But I just want to point this out. If we go to Luke's account, so this is like very parallel to Matthew, just a little more condensed, just Luke 3.8, this is what John is saying. 
Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we're descendants of Abraham, right? So that's like saying, I'm safe. I was dunked in water. I was baptized. I'm good. That means nothing for I tell you. God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. And so you got to mean it. We talked about this at Bible study, right? And I'm not throwing my wife under the bus here because she just raised her hand and said, I had, like what, like a false start. I had a fake baptism. She admitted it. She's like, I got dunked. You get all emotionally charged up, whether it be the beach, the sunset, woo, you know, or the, the worship music is great. Dunk, but she didn't mean it, and she admitted it. I didn't know what it was to be a Christian. Not safe. So this is what's going on here. They had Abraham, right? So prove by the way you live. Now, here's the thing. I want to point out a couple of things to you that nobody really talks about. And they're within this text. And I want you to just absorb this. And you go to the scriptures. I'll let him talk. So this is John talking, right? Prove by the way you live. You might remember his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Something he said of them that the first time it came to my attention, I was kind of like, what? Because I'd been filled with this like typical kind of Christian mantra, right? Though you can't do it, right? You can't, they, they couldn't do the law back then. Just read this, though. Luke 1, 6, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. It says living blamelessly, if you want to get literal on me, because that's what happens, right? I try to do an easy reader right, for people, because I know they're like kids who watch a message. I want everyone to understand. And they'll go, what version was that? Because I didn't like it, you know. <laughs> like, that, this is what it says. It says that John's parents were living blamelessly according to the law of Moses. You don't hear that too much, but it's there. And I don't think Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this, is lying. Paul. Look at what Paul says of himself. <laughs> Philippians 3, I was circumcised. So Paul wrote half-ish of the New Testament, 13 books of the New Testament, right? Inspired by the Holy Spirit to do so. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I, am a member of the Phar I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience, that word again, to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. So he was against the church at first. That's kind of a miracle. As for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Again, I was blameless according to the law of Moses. You think Paul's lying? I don't. I think he did. What he's saying right there is true. Blameless. Even before becoming a Christian, he got that obedience thing that Tony talked about last week down. You could do it. Otherwise, Paul's a liar. Luke's a liar. Holy Spirit's not a liar. That's true. Interesting. So, to context, He's going to rail against false teachers, dogs, right? So they're false workers. And so what he's doing, he's saying, I have a reason to brag too. I did all that too. And then he'll go on to say, garbage. It's all worthless comparing to know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And that's where we're going. So all that stuff, garbage. But despite this, there's a popular false teaching. And many who want to sin, they like to repeat. And here's what you're going to get. When I start talking, if this goes up in a reel, here's what we're going to get, right? We're going to get that guy who goes, no, and he'll quote this. <laughs> here's where it comes from. 1 John 1, 8. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. I will tell you exactly. So people will run with this, and they'll go, yep, we're just going to sin, so whatever, all right? But it's not a big deal. Here's how you get it. Here's how you get it. <laughs> you start there, and you stop there. That's exactly how you get it. These people are too lazy to turn the page, and that's what we're going to do. If you keep reading, this is immediately after those verses. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. It's literally the very next line. That's why when people post this, I'm like, like I'm getting tired. Like, I just delete it. I'm like, delete, I can't do this anymore. 
Read, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar. Is not living in the truth. But those who obey, this word's coming up a lot, isn't it? Those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. There's a key. We're going to come back to that. Those who obey God's word show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Those who say they live in God should leave, live their lives like Jesus did. They will obey God. Now, just a digression, just really just disclaimer here, because I want you guys to understand another thing. To be clear, no one could be made right by following the law of Moses. You can't be saved by following. Paul makes that very clear. Read Galatians, that's what it's all about. Very clear. Some are Romans, very clear. All right? No law, we're not under that anymore. That we're under the covenant of grace. But it's abusing that grace is the problem. So, not saying the law of Moses is something we should do. Peter, a yoke we and our fathers couldn't even bear. By the way, just because there are a lot of crazy people around this kick, we got to go back to the law of Moses. You're crazy. It's impossible. People who are better than math at me say it's 75% of the law of Moses. The Torah, the first five books of the Bible, cannot you don't have a lineage of a priesthood that can make the sacrifices. You have no temple, no tabernacle. It's very sad for Jewish people. Like, uh, if you didn't find the Messiah before the destruction of the temple, like, you got to go back. It's Jesus, right? So you can't do it. Plus, it's not a buffet. James 2.10 says that. The New Testament clarifies this point. If you fail in one point, you broke all of it. So, no. We are under the law of Christ. So what it's talking about here obeys God. Obey God's commands. Obey his law. What? Love. Jesus says, Matthew 7, 12, right? Loving others, treating others the way you want to be treated is this. It's the royal law, as it's called in the New Testament, right? So love. It's not the 613 commands and all these exact things. Everything else falls into place if we love everybody. It all kind of comes together. And that's my point here. So what's going on in 1 John? It's a paradox, <laughs> kind of a big word. So there are two seemingly contradictory or absurd statements that when you read them in context and understand what's going on, it makes sense. So what's happening here? You got to read carefully. What do we have? We have sin. We have a sinful nature. If we didn't, Jesus wouldn't need to die. We have a sinful nature. That is what it is to have sin. It's in there. And we have all sinned operative words here. And here's the thing. I'm going to keep reading because even though that exists, John, if you keep reading, is not letting anyone off the hook here. This is scriptural truth. Right? So it's, my wife was trying to do the kids' lesson. She's like, it's a lot of scriptures. I'm like, it's got to be when you say something hard. Because this is God, right? So if this is hard for you, you need to have that argument with God right now. Because, 1 John 3, 4, everyone who sins is breaking God's law. Again, not the law of Moses, right? Breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins. And there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not, and does not love their other believers so they're 
there, that's that Matthew 7, 12 thing. Other believers does not belong to God. This is very clear, crystal clear, and very serious. But here's the thing. We are born with sin. We have sinned. And here's the thing. Did I just tell you as a pastor, I have some in the fruit of the flesh column, right? Yes. Why? We may accidentally sin. Like, listen, I haven't always been a pastor, but I've heard pastors say bad words. <laughs> I come from New York, right? So that was really hard to get that out of that column, <laughs> really, really do. And once in a while, boom, something comes out, right? So, but it's like an accident. You know, I don't, like, seek to do that. It doesn't feel good when I do that. Now I'm like, oh, I hope I don't say a bad word in this sermon. That was the first thing I was most nervous about. I'm like, oh, I'm going to say bad words. It's going to happen. So <laughs> we may accidentally do it. And I've accidentally said stuff. You guys forgive me, right? Yes, right? So it, it, the thing here is we're not to be seeking it out. We're not to be seeking it out. And here's where we're going to go. Hebrews clarifies this. More hard scripture, but just hear it with the right heart. Hebrews 10, 26. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. That's hard. There's only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God, Jesus, and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy. They have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. So, you hear that sometimes in church, where it's like, oh, the law of Moses was so hard. Punishment was so severe. You know, but grace is cool, right? The Bible doesn't say that. How much worse will the punishment be? Because, see, there you just had, like, lambs dying for you. You had the Lamb of God. You had Jesus die for you. How much worse when you don't take that seriously? That's what's being said. They're serious verses. But here's the thing. All the more reason to read them. Just because people don't read them doesn't make them go away. Doesn't mean that they don't exist, right? So like it's like a kid thing, right? La, 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 I'm not listening, la, 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 la. But that's what a lot of people do. But at the end of your life, you will have to answer to this can't just make it go away. That's not my job. So it's really hard. This message pastors don't like preaching, but it's there. It's what the Word of God says. So how do we sort this out? And this is pastorally where I want to get you guys, right? So I'm not just going to stop. That would be terrible. Just stop there, right? We're going to see how we work it out. Here's the thing. We will sin. We should not be seeking it out. And it all comes down to this. We shouldn't be searching for a relationship with sin, if we are in a relationship with Jesus, right? That is the relationship that takes priority. We don't want to be searching for a relationship with sin. This is the key. It's all about relationship. It's about love. So it's made possible through love. That's what's being said here. The law is being followed by force doesn't work. I mean, you could do it, but probably like Peter says, Ugh. no, we should want to. The key is love. It's made possible by love. We should love Jesus so much that we don't want to sin. That's the point, and that's the key here. We should love Jesus more than whatever that go-to is. Right? So we see this picture. I told you we were going to come back to it with the devil tempting Jesus. He tempted him with some typical go-tos, if you look at it carefully. Things that seemed like a blessing. Jesus was refining himself. He's fasting. Fasting is a very good Christian practice. Something we should all be doing. Fasting. Praying. And here comes the devil. Hey, what's up? You hungry? Bet you are. You know, if you're... And there's the compound thing here. He's hungry. Well, if you're the son of God... Make some bread. 
appealing to his ego. Again, the ego, two more times. A lot of people don't understand this. The devil, he's the ruler of this world. That's what it says, clearly. So here's the thing, Jesus. I'll give you dominion over this. You're going to be the king of this world. Be short-sighted, Jesus, right, if you, if you worship me. No. Worship God alone. I'm going with Matthew's account or Luke's account. So <clears throat> he's appealing to his ego. Jump off. If you're the son of God, jump off. Right? You won't even dash your foot against a stone is what it says. Right? Ego. You can do whatever you want. You're Jesus. You can do anything you want and there will be no consequences. Really? No. Don't put God to the test. Scripture also says, so you see what the devil's doing? And a lot of people are preying on Christians today. They're saying, 1 John 1, 8 through 10, stop, 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 stop. And that's what the devil does. But Jesus says, scriptures also say, and then what do we see? 1 John 2, 1 John 3, we have to arm ourselves with the word of God against these deceivers because they can lead you into a trap. That's why you have to know the word. Jesus put God over the go-to. And here's the thing about the go-tos. The go-to, and Jesus sees this, right? They're temporary. It's temporary. My kingdom is not of this world, he says later. It's focused there. No. No, no, no. It's temporary. It's shallow. And in our lives, the go-tos, they come with baggage. They come with drama. They come with regret. They come with shame. They're not good, full of empty promises weighing us down. Here's the thing. You may have been introduced to Jesus. You may have met Jesus, but the question scriptures ask is, are you in a committed relationship with Jesus? That's the key. There's a really big difference. There's a really Big difference between dating and putting a ring on. It isn't there. There's some people who are like, <laughs> Jesus is looking for commitment. I got to lighten it up. It was getting really heavy for a long time. <laughs> said, you know, the regulars are like, Whew, usually breaks that up with a joke. <laughs> yeah. When we don't commit, here's the thing. Let's be real. Let's just be real. When we don't commit, what are we doing? It's like that. We're leaving the door open for something better. That's what we're doing. That's the truth. I see these engagements so funny as a pastor. Like, cracks me up. How long have you been engaged? Like, seven years? What? You know what I mean? Like, what is going on? Now, I, I, some man in the audience today is like, I hate this guy. We're never coming back. <laughs> but it's true. I got to call you out. Right? Like, we had a courtship. We dated for, it was like two years, something like that. And she's like, you don't remember? So I get myself in trouble. It's okay. <laughs> and you put a ring on it, right? Like, you're like, yeah, she's beautiful. I want to be with her. I want anyone else to get her. <laughs> you know, right? I spend too much money on the ring. But her mom helped. Anyway, so, <laughs> so dating, right? So let's, <laughs> let's go back to dating. Think about it. So those of you who are dated, you're going to totally get this, hopefully. Uh, you, you, you learned this lesson. But for, like, the younger people there, I'm going to teach you something else, right? So aside from the Bible, we're going to learn something here. So if you're on a date, like, maybe you were on a date, and you can remember dating, right? And it seems to be going well, and it's a Saturday. And so the person you're dating, you're on a date, they're like, this is going really well. But, and that's it. so here's the thing. This is, this is the pastoral lesson for you guys. After the word but, that's everything else the person really wanted to say. The first line was a setup for that. That's it. They don't really mean that. So <laughs> it's going well, but I think we should just hang out on the weekends. You know what that means? Okay, so here's how you answer that question. <laughs> this is how you, I'll give kids the answer to the question. If you're young, you're going to date, you hear that nonsense. Here's what you say. The weekends. Who's got the Monday through Friday shift? That's what that means. Yeah. And so that's the thing. They're telling you right away that they are really committed to someone else or something else. 
They could be like a workaholic. What it really means is at that point, you know you are not going to be a priority. You're not a priority. You're the weekend thing or fling. That's it. Get out. They're not committing to you. Now, some people do this with Jesus, right? So they might have found Jesus, and they, they might have told him, hey, Jesus, this is awesome. I'm glad I met you. Can we just hang out on the weekends? <laughs> and they thought, right, he was cool with that. Like, you shouldn't be cool with someone abusive like that, but he's got to be cool with that. See, look, he's not. If you heard that, that wasn't Jesus. He doesn't say that. So I do the little memes. Sometimes they're funny to me. But look, here's one. Look, let's just hang out on the weekends. Said Jesus never. <laughs> I go there. So yeah, all right. So if you heard that again, not Jesus. Jesus wants all of you. All of you. But this happens. Some find Jesus and they just like, it's cool if I just hang out with him on the weekend. Really. Okay, now here's the thing. Here's the thing. Disclaimer. Some of you are like, yeah, but this is my first time in church. This guy's crazy. All right, so look, it's a good start. That's what Sunday is all about. It's a good start. But I'm not talking about church is not like your entire relationship with Jesus. So we come together as the body of Christ, but when we're apart, we operate as a body of Christ. And so that's not what I'm talking about. You have to come to church. We're not open every day. So we don't do the service every day, all right? It's a start. I want to be encouraging to you guys, but we shouldn't hang there. We should be developing our relationship, right? We should want to commit. If we love Jesus, we'll want to hang out with him all the time. And that's how it gets. You know people who really love Jesus because it's almost like you're bothering them sometimes in their prayer life. When they're reading their Bible, you're bothering I'm having a really interesting conversation with Jesus right now. But then Jesus says, go love that person, please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> The more we develop a heart for him, this is the key, we're not going to want to sin. All right, you should have that picture of what he did for you. <laughs> you didn't have any of those things. No. Remember what he did for you. Put that right here. Why do you want to go sin now? Developing a relationship means spending time together. And so here's the thing. It, preparing your heart means clearing the calendar. So this is the first applicable, just simple step. How? Clear the calendar for Jesus. That's all. It's simple. One little thing at a time. Now, here's the thing. You may have said, I don't have time. I don't have time for a relationship. I'm too busy. Here's a true statement. It's going to hurt. We make time for things that are important to us. That is a true statement. We make time. You may have said, I don't have time for a relationship with Jesus. Okay, but here's the other one. going to sting. You had time for the go-tos. You had time for the go-tos. Right? So if we go up in the helium, you had time for the chocolate. Not the chocolate's a sin, right? So like, oh, is he saying, I can't eat chocolate? It's not a case of chocolate, right? So that's bad. Right? You had time for the wine. That's expensive sometimes. Yes, you can drink wine, but it's not a lot. You had time for that. If you had time for the cigarette, still doing that. It's the 2000s. Cut it out. <laughs> it's enough, right? That is bad. <laughs> you were destroying the temple of God. But you had time for that. And they're really expensive now. I stopped when they were like $2 a pack or something like that. You get them out of the machine that goes... <laughs> remember those? Anyway, <laughs> memories... Maybe you had time to look at something you weren't supposed to be looking at. It takes time, doesn't it? We need to make Jesus a part of our lives in those places. We need to replace those things with Jesus. So as we close, I'm going to give some encouragement and some practical steps. We're going to continue. We're going to kind of go into more of the house. But this is really the beginning. And if you'd stopped here, you'd probably be doing all right because... It's about loving Jesus, really loving him. Again, the dating analogy, right? When you got together, you don't want to date anybody else. That's how you know. <laughs> right? Didn't want to be with anyone else except my wife. I was like, that's, not, that's how I know. Not a problem. There's no open door for anything else. That's it. You're great. 
right? Like, I can't do any better than that. So it was logical, too, you know? So, <laughs> so here's the thing. Building relationships. So this is what we're going to just focus on. A, spending time together is the key to building relationships. When, I know, distance makes the heart grow fonder, right? But when you go too long, you grow apart. We don't want to do that with Jesus. Not good. The other thing is what we're going to get to. Listening. That's important in a relationship. But I don't know if you guys did this when you were dating. It was kind of funny because, you know, we weren't living together. We are dating and stuff. And so we're on the phone, right? And you're talking on the phone, talking, talking, talking. It's hours and it's late. We're getting tired. You're like, no, you hang up. You ever do that one? No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. And then, like, like you're, hours later, you, you know. <laughs> so, so, but see, we wanted to listen to one another or talk to one another. Well, Huh? Jesus, no, you hang up. Why aren't we like that? That's how you get to know a person. And so it's about listening, and that begins. So clear the calendar, right? So take one of the go-tos or something, and then when you normally do the go-to, do Jesus there. Like, put Jesus in that spot. That's what you do. That's it. Simple. How? It's like, listen, come back when you want to do this. How? Pretty easy. <laughs> Five minutes. Like, take something. Just give it to Jesus. This is your time, Lord. That's it. Now, I'm going to invite you into something practical. It's going to be kind of funny at first, especially if you've been in this church for a long time. It's going to seem like I kind of contradicted myself, especially if you've been here on a staff level. But I'll explain this to you. So here, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give everyone in this room and everyone online my phone number. You're going to get this is my, my cell phone number, okay? So there, put it on the screen. That's right. And I had everybody check it this morning because I was like, oh, man, if I type that in wrong, <laughs> that would be really funny. I just gave <laughs> everybody in the church the wrong number. And I was like, oh, why didn't I do that? <laughs> be perfect. <laughs> like, anyway, so here, <laughs> here's the thing. This is not a stunt. I've seen this done as a stunt. We're, like at a certain point, we had a lot more pastors on staff before I like started preaching the whole Bible and then people ran away. So <laughs> there are more pastors on staff. And then we had some pastor do this and we were all like on staff and I know we're like, oh gosh, oh no, no, no. Like he's showing off, you know what I mean? Like now I have to give my number. I'm just the worship leader at the time. I'm like, are you kidding me? And we hated this guy for a little while. It was tough to love your neighbor. I was like, I don't know if I can love this guy at all. He just put me, like threw me under the bus, like and everything. It was a stunt, you know. This is not a stunt. I want you to hear that. I'm not doing this to elevate. And if you're in leadership here, you do not have to give out because that's what you guys are doing. Like I do not want to give out. No, right, this is me. But did you notice the guardrails? Did you notice that? Monday through Friday, 7 to 7. All right? It's a lot of hours. It's a big window. Right? So there you go. That's my number. But here's, here's the purpose. <clears throat> Those of you who know me real well, you're on this list. And every morning, right about 7 o'clock, you get a text from me. And it's a Proverbs Devo. That's what these people in the church get. It's Proverbs devotional. Right? It's not the whole project. I want you to go open your Bible and read the proverb. It's not a lot of text, but you get the little Devo based on it. And there's a little reel for the kids, you know, that like a 60-second reel. You can just watch it about that topic. And it's a way of getting you in the Word. Right? So if you text me at that number, between 7 and 7, right? So th here's the real truth. At 7 p.m., my phone goes off. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Go ahead and text me anytime you want. It, I'll get it 7 a.m. Pastor, I send me the Proverbs, Debo. Cool. Good. And I'll send it to you. It's not a long read. It doesn't take a long time. Here's the other thing. And <laughs> And I'm not going to say who said this the first time, Jacqueline. But anyway, she, they told me that, <laughs> that somebody thought it was a computer program. It was like a, a computer program. And I know this is true. I was like, it's just this one person. <laughs> no, it's not. Because you ever go like shopping online, right? You could do that as a Christian. It's okay. So you shop online. And then here's what you get. Like if you give us your phone number, you can text for 10% off your next order or something like that, right? So you put your number in. And then what do you do immediately? Stop like that. You all capital letters. Like no. Someone actually did that to me. I sent it in the morning. This is how I knew they were hungover. I sent it in the morning. And what came back? Stop. I was like. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you are still drunk. So anyway, <laughs> so it's me. <laughs> like, I'm actually texting. I do copy and paste, but I text it to you. It's an open door. It's a relationship building thing. This is my office door opening up. 
It's an efficient way for you to just, maybe you need prayer about something. Maybe you need to talk to me. Maybe you want to schedule time and talk on the phone. All of that. Like, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. All right? Now, so on the 7 to 7 thing, real quick, because this has just got to be said. I'm going to say this in the fact. Some people say, well, oh, my gosh, what if I have an emergency? What if I have an emergency? I'm like, you know how many times I have been called after 7 p.m. and it's, like, actually an emergency? Never. <laughs> like, it's usually you're drunk. Like, that's what it is. That's because you started drinking. And I don't want to talk to you when you're drinking. I just don't. Like, so <laughs> go to sleep. That's usually what, if I actually accidentally picked up the, go to bed. That's what you're going to hear. And I'm going to hang up the phone. Right? Because it's not a good idea. You're going to say things and it's, you're not going to remember. Right? So that's the thing. But there are two things that you can do if you can't get in touch with me. Here's one. 911. If it's an actual emergency, they are far better equipped. Like, Deputy Johnson is going to get there quickly, right? And he's going to have a taser, which is really awesome. And which I, I wish I had if I had to talk to you at 8 o'clock. Like, like, go to bed. So, <laughs> you know? so anyway, 911, they are equipped in the emergency. There's somebody else. I'm just going for it. I'm fired today. So like, there's somebody else, right? How about this? God, he's better equipped than even Deputy Johnson. God, go talk to God. This is what's going on here. He is far better equipped than any of us. What do we learn from John? Preparing the way, now you go there. I'm just like a, shepherd, a relationship facilitator. I like make the introduction. I want to help you with the training wheels. But eventually, we got to get those training wheels off. You have to go on your own. You have to rely on God, not me. Well, this is the thing as we close. We are not the Savior here. And you could be doing this in other relationships. So many stories, including my wife's. They finally got on their knees and took it to the Lord when no one else was enabling them. That. So many people have a Savior complex. You're not the Savior in this story. Got news for you. I'm not your Savior. Don't come to me. Go to God. I give you some advice along the way, but I'm not your savior. That's it. I'm showing you where to go. Scriptures, not even me. Too many people, pastors included, they have a savior complex. It's pride. That's why you're picking up the phone. And too many people get in the way. Too many people, the worst thing you can do is make yourself the go-to. Great. We don't want to do that. My job, like John, is to prepare a way for the Lord. I'll help you out while you need the training wheels. We can even take them off and I'll be like this. But eventually, what? Go. You're good now, right? That's my job. I'm just here. Him. 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 I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Elijah. I'm not Jesus. That's Jesus. You go there. We need to be less dependent on the go-tos, more dependent on God. And so it all comes down to this relationship. We should depend on every word that comes from the mouth of God, not man. So here's the thing. As we move upward in Christ, we do so by turning away from those things, cutting ties, replacing them with a good relationship with Jesus. They're weighing us down anyway, ultimately. We will be freed from them. And we cut those ties and enter into right relationship with Jesus so we can experience the fullness of Christ and all that he has to offer. That love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that goodness that only comes from Jesus. Amen? Amen. We pray for you, Lord. I thank you for this church, everyone in the sound of my voice, whether they tune out online or they're here, I thank them for coming and taking the time to be here, to kind of tune out the world a little bit. Lord, we thank you for your word. And I just pray you build each and every one of these individuals up by the power of your Holy Spirit. Build them up and encourage them to come into relationship with you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.